Good morning and welcome to the NAMA Forum. My name is Priya Doshini Chingakam and I'm the current, current president. Professionally, I work as the Assistant Vice President of Marketing Automation in Wintrust Financial Corporation in Chicago. Our first guest today is someone who needs no introduction to the people of Manipur. Lieutenant General Dr. Himalay Konsum is the first Brigadier, the first Major General, and the first Lieutenant General in the Indian Army from Northeast India. He commanded his battalion, 27 Rajput, during Operation Kar Vijay Kargil in Chalunka at Battle Point 5770 in 1990, for which he was awarded the Youth Seva Medal. He was also the general officer commanding of an infantry division in the line of control in Jammu and Kashmir, Punch and Rajouri sector, and was awarded the Ati Vishist Seva Medal. He was ex officio security advisor to the government of Jammu and Kashmir and was also awarded the Uttam Youth Seva Medal. As far as I remember, he has also authored two books, The Making of a General, a Himalayan Echo, and Romancing the Line of Control. Welcome to our inaugural forum, General Himalay, and thank you for being with here, uh, being with here with us today. Thank with you so much. With the current turmoil in Manipur, the theme for this discussion hour is together on the path to peace and healing in Manipur. Joining us as our panelists are Dr. Shurzilal Serma, Adhikari Mayum, he is a physicist and currently teaches at the University of Maryland. A past president of NAMA and a current chair of its board of trustees, he has engaged with colleagues in India, particularly in Manipur, in collaborations in research and education. Dr. Lalit Pukrambam, also a past president of NAMA, holds PhD in biochemistry from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and currently teaches at Wayne State Medical School, Detroit, Michigan. He is a tenured associate professor and currently research researches on diabetes and eye diseases. Dr. Thoyen Paisnam is an economist and head of the Global Transfer Pricing Planning and Strategy at Willis Towers Watson, a leading global advisory broking and solutions company. Thoyen holds a PhD in economics from the University of Maryland and a master's in economics from the Delhi School of Economics. He specialized in industrial organization, game theory, and econometrics. General Himale, thank you again for joining with us today here. And I hand over to you now for a few, uh, to you for your introductory remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Priya. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Nama Forum for inviting me in this very, very uh, uh, all of you who are so illustrious and doing so well in the Americas. I'm privileged to be amidst you. First of all, we are here to discuss the issues of uh, what is happening in Manipur and also Manipur and around. In a brief introduction, as I understand it, and in the next about 12 minutes, 13 minutes, as uh, Priya has allotted me for an uh, introductory remark, I will try and cover something which uh, m mostly, it, it must have been already known to you, but I will re-emphasize my own thoughts on what I feel. It may not necessarily be the official view of uh, whatever the academicians or even government of India or government of Manipur thinks. I will share whatever my perspective is. Going back in history, a little, not much. History is contested. History is in the making. And many histories are also being constructed day by day all over the world and particularly in our region. Everything begins from how we consider ourselves as far as our identity is concerned, the ethnicity. Most believe that all the ethnicities of tribal people in the entire Northeast India have originated from 
you know, a kind of South West and the South East Chinese uh, territory, Southeast Asia, Myanmar, Tibet, Tibet, to some extent, because most of our language groupings fall under the category of Tibeto Burmese uh, language or dialects. Little more focused, the Kukis and even the some of the many of the Naga dialects include also the Maite Lon, that is Manipuri language, also fall, fall in the Kukichin group of languages. So thereby meaning that some kind of a common ancestry, maybe 2000, 3000 years ago. Now, the only recorded kind of a history is in Manipur's, all of you are aware, Saitharul Kumbaba. Actually, he was written sometime in 14th, 15th century, not in 33 AD, though it begins with 33 AD. Similarly, King of Tripura, the Tripura Maharaj also had the king that was also written sometime in 15th century. And if you go back in times of Mahavarata and all that, they used to classify anyone east of Meghna or east of Brahmaputra sometimes as Kiratas. In fact, one uh, writer went to the extent of calling the Kukis as the Kiratas of Mahavarata in this region. So there are no authentic, as I see it, we can refer to some history, historians, famous Dr. Kamai, then, you know, many other historians of Manipur. But it is only now in the recent past, about 20 years back, that the resurgence of historical identities, particularly amongst the uh, cookies, came up in a big, big way. Come down around 16th century, 1670, turn of 17th century, it all began with the Maites having, many Maites having converted to Hinduism. I think that was the beginning of a, a recognition of, uh, or not recognition, you know, the diverse diversity more got in intensified. And those days, the idea of kingdom was mostly on uh, uh, territory, and you subjugate a particular tribe and then you claim that that is the territory, not really much of a uh, administration or governance as we understand it today. To the extent that if you look at 1762 agreement between East India Company and the, the Raja or Mekle, Mekle is what was known as uh, Manipur was known in 1762, says that um, Raja, Maharaj, Raja of Manipur is allowed or can will be permitted to have his uh, you know uh, gold mines in Sivsagar that is you know well north of even the present day boundaries so boundaries expanded and then got collapsed depending on the power of the king of all empires those days and all these areas because of geographical reasons they were generally as frontiers which continued during the period of British colonialism, which started at least in Manipur around 1826. The contact of the British colonialism further intensified that kind of a difference between, you know, uh, they had the excluded areas and, you know, uh, under the Ministry of External Affairs till uh, even after Indian independence. So, that is a very brief introduction as to how uh, till the 1947. It's very unfortunate that many people don't know that um, the king of Manipur had uh, the, you know, many cookies also in the army, like uh, in the Manipuri army. For example, when Vagasandra went to assist the Ahom king in sometime in 1780s or something, there were uh, and he went with um, over 2,000 soldiers, of which I believe there are no um, uh, record. Uh, I believe at least three to 400 were cookies. I'm talking about around 18th century and even some Nagas. So that is the beginning. But what happened in after independence? The Anyway, I will not go into the merger and all that. The state's reorganization committee 
actually in rest of India mostly was on language basis, you know, language basis, but in the Northeast India, my understanding is they try to make it on ethnic lines due to whatever reasons they calculated in during that time. However, in case of Manipur and the Tripura, being very, very old kingdoms, they said, okay, okay these are to be recognized kingdoms. In fact, in 1890, uh, 1880, uh, 1892, during the British Parliament um, debate, Manipur was classified as a uh, loyal ally uh, and uh, uh, say it's a powerful ally in East Asia. I mean, that was the kind of respect that the British had for the Kingdom of Manipur. So how did it go wrong now is that basically after the, you know, various um, affirmative actions, you know, we the tribes are scheduled, some were not, we were not, we were not scheduled as tribes. And uh, uh, then slowly the social order, which was the um, pre you know, it was uh, that was the dominating factor in individual uh, or society's status, social order. But in the last 30, 40 years, or maybe 20 years, 20 to 40 years, I think the issue became one of economy, economics, one of, you know, livelihood, one of aspirations. And aspirational every group, because obviously in a democracy, everyone has the right to have aspirations, everyone has the right to yearn for equality, everyone has the right to uh, fight for it in a democratic forum. But in our case, just see the imbalance between uh, various laws, imbalance of uh, population and at, at times, imbalance of uh, uh, even governance, all this factor over the last 40 to 50 years. I'll give you an example. Imbalance, I'll say, as far as population is concerned, disproportionate growth of this disproportionate um, wealth among some people, disproportionate level of corruption and governance, and also sense of uh, superiority among some uh, people, you know, trying to live the 21st century in the format of uh, 19th century. So this kind of issue was building up for a very, very long time, coming straight to the cookie might uh, uh, issue now. They, it all started sometime, some kind of a nationalist ideas from Mizo insurgency in 1965 onwards, when the Mizos or the Lusais they started running away to southern Manipur. They tried to say that, okay, you, you and I are, you know, a kind of a kin. Similarly, when the, when the Naga, Naga National Council, NNC led by FISO started uh, in uh, Nagaland, they also, in order to escape the, the, the ferocity of the police and the Assam rifles that time, they also came down to North Manipur and said that we are all one and Naga club and all that. So because you need shelter, you need more, you know, more um, linkages, you need more uh, assistance from your, and then if you don't have construct kids and kids in some, uh, you know, uh, 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 trying to get into some kind of a narrative. So that is how it all started. And then came the, uh, you know, uh, the, the aspiration increase. I talked about imbalance, like while the Maitis prospered because of the agricultural land in the valley, the, uh, you know, the uh, affirmative actions led to similar, as like today, about 75 to 80% of all senior officers in the Manipur Secretariat and the government was uh, cookies mostly, some Nagas. And also this kind of uh, imbalance actually doesn't work in a small way. So all this was building up. But the immediate cause of what happened on the 3rd of May or what was building up between January and May are all well known to you. And as we discuss further, we'll 
uh, we'll cover that in that uh, as we discuss. So this was a brief introduction as far as the past is concerned. And uh, should there be, because I told you 13 minutes and it's already 13 minutes now. So uh, we, will, uh, we will cover it as we uh, progress. Thank you, Priya, and we will uh, take on from here. Thank you, Tamu. Thank you, General Nale. Uh, that was very insightful, and that was very helpful too for us, you know, to understand how uh, in context to this current conflicts. So our first question comes from Dr. Surjula Sarma, and this is on multi multiculturalism and ethnicity, and how this has this has characterized the current turmoil in Manipur. Uh, Dr. Surjula, please go ahead. Yeah, so ethnicity, as uh, General Himalay also mentioned, has been the center or front and center of the current disturbances or turmoil in Manipur. And uh, ethnicity is always there. It has been recognized. But now this is leading to violence and many other forms of conflict. And this, I think, is not uh, isolated in Manipur. In the world today, there are many places or conditions in which this form of ethnicity or the need to address what we mean by ethnicity or should we define our identities in terms of ethnicity alone or to combine many other aspects of our lives, our societies. And uh, this debate has been uh, very active, including many Nobel laureates and economists, the wealthiest people in the world, and so many other uh, luminaries. So it is difficult not to think in terms of this kind of approach to our problem in Manipur. How should or how we can view the ethnicity and broader in, uh, in the broader sense of multiculturalism. That is to try to define the identity in terms of many aspects, ethnic background, religion, culture, economic status, so many other things. However, in Manipur now, it is a very sensitive issue to bring up such a issue or such a perspective. I would like to uh, get your view on whether such a perspective is uh, interesting for Manipur in general, and if so, what would be some simple approaches or pathways towards addressing this? Of course, this cannot be something that can come from outside. It has to be generated within the people itself in the form of discussion. Thank you uh, for your question, uh, Professor Surajlan. Uh, I totally agree, uh, I mean, with your thoughts. I'll just give a contrasting view, uh, both. I'll just compare. There are 65 tribes in Orissa, 65 tribes. And all the tribes combine Nagaland, Manipur, Mizoram, Meghalaya, and Tripura have less population than the tribes of Orissa, 65 tribes. And there are no issues there. The reason is that somehow the process of integration, somehow the process of assimilation, though assimilation is a little stronger word, uh, has succeeded in those areas. Urisa, we don't hear. There's 65 dialects. Because they have taken the affirmative actions over a period of many, many, uh, at least 100 years. Now come back to Manipur, just with 35 tribes, not even 10% of the tribal population of uh, Orissa. Yet we cannot live. I mean, it is time, signs are showing that, you know, there are a lot of dissonance. So I believe 
that uh, governance issues have been a very, very major factor. One factor in Orissa is that they're all Hindus or Hindu related kind of ideology, though there are many Christians now amongst the tribes also. So I think governance, whereas our governance system uh, started after 1950s, uh, whether it was right or wrong, I have no comments, but it has not succeeded in what it together. In the notice, we have more than 270 such tribes and sub-tribes. But we must recognize the fact that times change, social orders change, people cannot be, uh, you know, um, placed in the same place as we uh, saw in 100 years back, 200 years back, economy, uh, economic and people's aspirations take. Uh, so from that point of view, I'm, I'm of the view that multiculturalism and unity and diversity can be respected and can still be uh, achieved uh, in the entire Northeast India, provided the governance and the law. When I say governance, it's a very vast term, but um, laws and such governance have to be in the correct manner. And I am for multiculturalism, and I'm sure the constitution is multi uh, itself is of this. So I'll say enforcement of this, but the manner of enforcement is what might create certain frictions. I hope partially I've been able to discuss this with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Surzulal. Thank you, uh, General Himale. So the second question is from Dr. Lalit. So many believe that illegal infiltration and poppy cultivation has engineered this current crisis. And Dr. Lalit's question is in regards to uh, this and how this has escalated, how this communal things and how this communal violence has escalated to this level. Yes. Uh... Thank you, General, for coming to the forum. And uh, before I ask the question, I want to convey a message from the uh, convener of uh, Kokomi, uh, Jitendra Ningomba, on his personal note, that when he learned that this uh, NAMA forum, the General is going to be the guest, he was happy and uh, want to say uh, congratulations and best wishes to General and the NAMA for this forum. So I'm just conveying his personal uh, not um, from the Kokomi organization, but his personal uh, message. Okay. Now the question I have is from many of our members. It's not my question only, but it's a combination of many questions we received. So the, it is that how far it is valid claiming by some citizens of Manipur that illegal Chin Myanmar's uh, infiltration and the narco terrorism are influencing Manipur politics and uh, present unrest in the state. So a general uh, perspective on this topic. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit? Uh, Professor Lale, thank you very much. It's a highly tested kind of a narrative and highly sensitive as well. My own assessment is that the narcotics, it includes everything, uh, issue in Manipur and also generally Mizoram and some parts of other places, this threat to the national security is for real. To give you an example, my personal belief is that the narcotics trade in Mizoram and Manipur will cross close to anything between 40,000 to 80,000 crores rupees turnover yearly. That's a huge money. How is it that this is? As we all know, the Golden Triangle sustained various insurgent groups in the Southeast Asia, particularly since the 
50s or 60s. Northern Myanmar is full of these powerful private armies funded through the narco uh, trade, partially through the narco trade. And uh, in the last about 20 years, what I saw, I mean, I, uh, I'll say I inferred, is that somehow the Golden Triangle appears to have leaned towards the West, that is, towards Manipur. Why? Because the Western countries, particularly the US, got after this drug thing in the Golden Triangle. They went very strong against it in the Golden Triangle. So I think there was spillover of this kind of uh, activities towards the West in parts of Manipur, more particularly in parts of Manipur. That is why the increase is not just yesterday's creation. Now the issue which you uh, raised is, is it, is the unrest uh, quelled or encouraged by drug? My experience in Jammu and Kashmir, Pakistan terrorists, and also erstwhile, I was in Mizoram, I was in Nagaland, I was in Manipur, in various critical times, I find that such kind of a movement, insurgency or terrorist groups, they definitely look for funding from legal or illegal sources at all times. Therefore, my conclusion is that there will be some nexus as to how deep I'm not talking only about the cookie militants now. I'm talking about all the insurgent groups of all groups look for illegal ways to make money. So therefore, I do not rule out any kind of, I, uh, I'll say positively, I feel that these will definitely have a huge impact on the, creating an instability in any region, including our state. Does it partially answer your? Thank you very much. It is uh, quite clear. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lalit. Uh, our next question is from Dr. Tohen, and this is in regard to how this current crisis has escalated to the, the level of mistrust in the state and the central government. And and it has escalated at an alarming rate. You know, how do we tackle this? The fear of future has set in. How do we do this? So, Tohen, take away, please. Uh, thank you very much, um, Priya. And uh, General Himale, it's um, my absolute honor and privilege to share this space with you. Um, and as I have heard you speak um, on several occasions, about the fear of the future of different communities as one of the main driving force for this conflict. And we understand, you know, there are fear, uh, legitimate fears, you know, of people losing their land, their identity, uh, their jobs, getting boxed in tight spaces. And, and I, we also kind of see, or the manifestation of, um, some political and international elements um, that have resulted in the exploitation of this fear for some of their vested interests. Right? And today we are seeing this, uh, you know, this fear and, you know, the manifested in a, a, a huge trust deficit, be it among the communities or trust deficit that the people held towards uh, the government and institutions, right? People feel that they have not been served well or served half-heartedly to a certain extent by the institutions that are meant to serve and protect them. So my question 
to you, uh, General Mala, is with respect to your perspective of how how do you see the role of government as well as the civil societies as responsible agents to address this fear um, and also address you know the uh, aspirations of the people in the context of a united Manipur rather than you know playing on the fear to 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 um, divide along say ethnic lines or whatever but how do we see the effective form, form of governance from your perspective uh, to to um, address this fear in the context of a united Manipur. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, okay. It is my privilege to be sharing the platform with you as well, with each one of you. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, I agree with you, the fear, fear factor. You know, what happens is when fear sets in, then the rumors start. When the rumors you know, uh, uh, gain momentum, then uh, the adrenaline, the anger, the passions rise. And the group behavior is totally different any one of you in who has done some kind of a organizational behavior will tell you that individual behavior is totally different from group dynamics. So therefore, the group dynamics has taken over mostly because of fear. As once I think Mahatma Gandhi did say that, or I think was it uh, some French philosopher who said that uh, the 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 societies they perish when when people fail to uh, people uh, who can influence don't uh, don't don't act or something don't speak up or something for the truth something like that i'm reminded of that when you said that first i must say that government of india and uh, government of manipur also i think at least i can uh, say that government of India is uh, very, very concerned. All the governments are very concerned about what is happening. Uh, I said this in some forum also, that the Home Minister, vis uh, I, I met him twice, Home Minister visiting a state and staying for three days has never happened in the independence in India's history, in a small state right. So, and uh, they're very concerned, but I'm not very sure whether uh, they have a proposed solution right now. They are working on a proposed solution. You know, they started with peace committees and rehabilitation and, you know, Supreme Court monitored uh, investigations and CBI inquiries and, you know, track two. Um, when I say track two, some kind of efforts I know are uh, in the process, but none so far appear to people like you and me to be succeeding. So the first thing is that uh, people are concerned because just see the context. India is uh, being recognized in the world as one of the emerging powers. In fact, the leader of the third world, so-called that time, you know. And the G20, then you, what is happening between China and US and the Ukraine war, India is getting into a position of, you know, some kind. At this, I don't think anybody in center uh, will like this to flare up. No, that is a very, very small angle, actually. In the overall context, India, we cannot allow this Manipur issue to pull India down. What is happening now? So uh, I think some of the concrete steps uh, which are being taken, uh, which were attempted, has not worked so far, but I think things will settle down, um, uh, settle down through, what I am not aware is what are the political, uh, you know, uh, issues, or what are the political initiatives that are being taken, because I'm not aware of that. Uh, but I know that they, they definitely are concerned and they're working towards it. So, uh, Dr. Twain, I will um, uh, I will end this because uh, the 
the fear factor has overtaken overtaken as i said fear of jobs and the others but that is not only uh, i think i'll call it the identity factors you know that loss of identity loss of group uh, you know uh, status loss of territory loss of everything has combined as i mentioned in one discussion all the i think uh, stars connive to make this happen in manipur all of a sudden all of a sudden means it was building up there but to ignite what is what unimaginable thing what has happened most unfortunate incidents have happened and uh, which i cannot imagine this happening uh, in the 21st century in our state when our young people in the valley in the hills oh, so you know aspirational i can't tell you staying in north america in the changes in manipur in last 20 years phenomenal i couldn't recognize but what is it that force which wanted to push us down i can't understand i'm trying to still educate myself thank you thank you very much general for that perspective thank you to to end i think that's the question in every uh one's mind now you know the mistrust that has set in you know bit uh on the governments both the central and the state government thank you for your question and thank you for giving insight to that uh general himale so the next question is about education yeah uh, we know that the state has been in limbo for the last three months schools and colleges have were suspended for most part of this three month uh because of the ethnic class. So Dr. Shirzilal, being an educator, is deeply concerned about this. And his next question is regarding the education and about uh, the school uh, and the college students back in, back in the state. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Priya. Uh, General Himala, you mentioned about the aspirations of the young people in Northeast. And that's a segue to the next discussion I would raise about uh, education. Education, as we know, at least in our generation and in other generations, has been the main focus of what parents like to do or provide to their children, particularly in the Northeast. In Manipur, we, we clearly remember the sacrifices that our parents had to make to, so that we could get a good education. And education is not in a good state in the current situation. And education is not local. Many of us came left Manipur to get edu get education, and that's not just in my generation, the previous generation, and following generation too. And with mobility, one tend to get good education and then work for the aspirations that anyone has. Mobility in the current situation is a very difficult one. Everyone is localized in their own local regions. Uh, students in the valley have access to more facilities or opportunities than those who are in the hills. And the mobility is very limited, so they are essentially losing their opportunity to a better education and to fulfill their aspirations to do well as well as do well for the society so this recognition i think can be quite universal i think all parents recognize education is important so it could be some level of uh, rallying that tend to be recognized by a broader group of people across the different, let's say, groups. And this, I think, would be an important uh, railing point for looking at the broader issues. Uh, my question would be mainly, how do we get about doing this? I think uh, there are efforts and people are beginning to talk about it. And uh, if we have uh, 
this kind of movement as a unifying point that might help trying to see ways to bring people together. Thank you for your question, Dr. Shuzlat. Uh, your concerns are totally uh, legitimate and very, very forceful. When I visited some of the areas uh, where there was firing going on uh, in Manipur, I saw young boys, class 11, 12, 13, you know, college boys uh, getting involved indirectly, you know, in um, maybe in kind of um, uh, propaganda, I won't say propaganda, you know, in terms of support to their respective, uh, respective ethnic groups. Other day, this Barkhadar showed a video herself in Manipur with one of the cookie boys who was in 11th standard with guns. So that is the kind of concern. This concern is totally education is something which uh, can bring people together. But as of now, as of now, things are so, uh, you know, divided that uh, my my view is allowing people to, you know, like other day, my own department uh, in the Manipur University, we decided that, you know, let's send our uh, lecture script online to, you know, the people who left the, the boys who left the university and then even allow students to appear from any centers from anywhere in India for, you know, this kind of a uh, appear the exam. Such kind of initiative is not working so far. You'll be surprised to know there are, I mean, my estimate is close to 55,000 to 65,000 students are studying outside of Manipur, outside of Manipur in various states of the country. And about 1.7 lakhs Manipuris, including Naga, Kuki, everyone, all tribes are either studying or working outside. So therefore, the chances of the students uh, getting, uh, you know, getting into, edu uh, you know, the uh, affected students, particularly from the hill areas, because most of the good educational uh, institutions are in the plea now, uh, even the private ones. So therefore, I see a very big setback um, for the students, particularly from Koki community, because of this uh, divide which has uh, taken place. And uh, educationists from Manipur, I will, uh, I think they, uh, they will be working, they should be working towards how to bring education in the forefront so that at least the uh, people, uh, the students don't uh, suffer. Uh, I think it's a huge setback. Yeah, it's a huge, huge setback to the education sector uh, for the uh, in the state. Thank you, General Himale. That was very enlightening mm -hmm. because we know that education is the most uh, important thing, you know, for uh, for the state, for the nation to go forward even further. Thank you again for that. Uh, the next question is on Assam Rifles. So Assam Rifles is a paramilitary group that Manipur has a history with and who just plagued with grievances and mistress and distress. You know, we hear so many things about, uh, you can say here, say, but, you know, all these grievances brought forward by so many CSOs and so many associations. So Dr. Lalit's next question is on Assam Rifles. Dr. Lalit, please take away. Thank, thank you, Priya. Uh... This uh, question came up in many of our members' uh, uh, minds, questions. So I'm just putting it out uh, as a common uh, question uh, to general that the people's uh, grievance against security forces, particularly the, the Assam Rifles in Manipur, uh, so has been raised in many uh, of these, uh, uh, I don't know, rallies and other things. So. 
we would like to have some uh, insight into the history and the role of Assam Rifles in Manipur. And uh, we feel that a good relationship between the security forces and the civilians is essential for Manipur peace and security. So we cannot have that uh, division or mistrust between the security forces and the people they are going to serve. So what, what perspective on this as a you know, army man, general? So we would like to hear something about this. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Lalit. Also, those who have uh, directed this question. Actually, uh, my view is that even the, I think the memorandum submitted by 40 MLAs, which is circulating in the social media against the, one of the point being against the Assam Rifle is against, I think, three, uh, three Assam Rifle units located at one, uh, these three different places, not the entire Assam Rifles. I mean, I have seen that memorandum. So uh, these MLAs, uh, 40 MLAs who have complained against the Assam Rifles, they restricted their uh, uh, complaints to these three units. What happened in these three units, I can only see it through the medium of social media and others. I do not rule out any lower level you know, body language, or even I saw some uh, that's uh, Casper vehicle blocking the Manipur police. Under what circumstances they did it? In the actual, not what appeared in the uh, social media. If those are true, then these should not have happened at the lower level. But I feel that overall, as a force, some rifle has got many units as a force. We can, we should not uh, condemn the entire force because uh, some rifle has been uh, there in the history of Manipur right since it started as Kasar Levi in 1826. As you know, that part of Kasar Levi or this thing was also instrumental in liberation of Manipur, uh, you know, during Raja Gambir Singh's time and uh, has had a very um, big contribution also as far as the notice is concerned. But as I said earlier, the historical, if you see the uh, my, in the minds of people, what happened you know, in Oinam and Manoreba uh, incident episode and all that, in the psyche of people there are, and also the exercise of armed forces, um, uh, Special Power Act and Justice Hague Day Commission's report and all that has actually given impetus to the distrust against the force as such. But the complaint is directed towards only uh, two or three uh, units. So, uh, but we should not, uh, I'm of the opinion that we should allow the security forces with complete trust uh, to uh, because they are in the buffer zone, because it was, I believe, that agreed. Uh, some rifles sent out a clarification. It was agreed that uh, no party will cross the buffer zone uh, on their own. I mean, I believe that was the clarification given. So the I, my experience is that any operations of this kind uh, invites criti criticism from many quarters. I have faced it many times. And uh, Assam Rifles uh, and the security forces also should try and uh, remove such doubts if there are any in the minds of people. And it is in the overall interest of the state and both sides to let the security forces function well. Uh, and the security forces responsibility to make sure that they act as well as seem to be acting impartially to the public. Yes, uh, that is important that uh, to have a good relation with the protector and uh, the people who are protecting. If they don't trust each other, it's going to be a big issue. Yeah. So I, I, I hope that 
both sides address this uh, issue amicably and to bring about a good understanding that will be important uh, i i think i not only i but uh, most of our listeners and the people in manipur will agree with that thank you thank you thank you dr lalit that was a very important question and in the minds of almost all people of Manipur, you know, the distrust that has set in between certain paramilitary uh, forces units like Dr. General, uh, uh, General Himala has mentioned, uh, is important for us as well as those units to start acting in a trustful way. Uh, the next question and the last of it, I would say, you know, is from Dr. Thoyan. And, you know, I would confidently say that what most people in Manipur now want is for this violence to be curved, to be stopped. Civilians are caught in the action in this violence. More than 150 people have died and over 50,000 displaced. How do we bring these two ethnic communities fighting now to overcome this trust deficit? Our next question from Tohen is on this. Tohen, you can elaborate more on that. I'll pass it on to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, General Himale just wanted to get uh, a sense, um, you know, from your vast experience as uh, a military commander, as well as, uh, you know, after your uh, service in the military, you continue to serve the nation and the state in various capacities. So my, my sort of question uh, is, what can you share about your experience? And I'll put this into two parts. The first part is um, your experience and what you can share with us about uh, being a key member of the uh, Naga Peace Discussions, uh, things that are relevant to this conflict. Well, in particular, what are some of the things that have worked and what are some of the pitfalls uh, to avoid? And uh, especially, you know, what, in your view, is the role of the CSOs and thought leaders to be most effective in this process? That's the first part of my question. Relatedly, um, the second part is with regards to your experience uh, in, in, in the military as commanding, you know, uh, our army, which is, you, uh, uh, comprising of servicemen from various communities and the sort of unity and camaraderie that have existed in the in the uh, service, and you know what can we learn from that to apply in in our situation? In particular, you know, is there something a practical way that you can suggest? Um, to bring together, for example, ex-servicemen from different communities, be it Maite, Nagas, Cookies, et cetera, to overcome this trust deficit that, you know, you have spoken about, many of our members have, have you know, sort of brought, to overcome this trust deficit uh, and to, to bring about, you know, a, a path towards peace, if you will. So, I would appreciate your uh, perspective on those two points. Uh, thank you, General. Okay, uh, Dr. Thoyan, thank you very much. A little uh, longest question, but I will try and restrict to the major points that you uh, brought up. The first thing is uh, that actually you mentioned about Naga peace discussion. Actually, I'm uh, not, I don't take part in the talks because uh, it is between NSE and I am and the government of India interlocutor. Manipur government is not in the scene and I'm not in the scene. What I'm involved is as a as a, we call it consultative um, group along with Mr. Radha Vinod. Priya's uh, uncle, uh, both of us, uh, in the consultative capacity, both for state government and the uh, central government. That is my role as far as there is concerned. So I will try and draw some uh, uh, issues also from there. The first question you uh, was about the, I'll just, I think, um, take it one by one. Uh, ex-servicemen I'll take up. 
ex servicemen, we have approximately 12,500, 13,000 or so ex servicemen from Manipur. Majority are from Chorasanpur district, approximately 6,000, and others are all spread uh, in all the districts. During the classes, um, when we did, uh, I wanted to initiate what you just said, you know, some kind of ex servicemen. Uh, issue or initiative so we did collect some uh, from you know some uh, funds from i think 30 or of retired officers and i was there to hand over uh, to the honorable governor uh, about two about two months back and uh, in that uh, we said that it is for all like servicemen you know ex servicemen Two were killed from uh, Cookie side, and one was killed during the classes or during all follow up. One or uh, mighty, I think. Uh, so it was very unfortunate to see the ex servicemen uh, who have been, we consider ourselves as a family, and then divided on ethnic lines. But in a tribal society like ours, I feel that you know uh, the um, tribal affinity and uh, ethnic affinity becomes far stronger than these bonds because you know finally they realize that we have to stay. Notwithstanding that, I know each one of the ex servicemen in Manipur, whether he is uh, Kuki or Maite, have this in their in their hearts that we were together and we must continue. So. In order to get that, we are trying uh, to do some kind of a uh, effort towards this. That was the first point. The second one point was about CSOs. In fact, the entire issue is about CSO. Problem solving or the path way forward is the role of the CSOs. I will put it at the most important role much far more than politics political uh, people because political people are looking to cso's to provide answers or to provide suggestions for their respective communities and many communities can't even say what we want so uh, and even if they want why because people are disunited people one cso for example there are Many, many CSOs uh, trying to save uh, Manipur. At least in Imphal area itself, there are far too many. Whether all of them will agree to the points um, uh, made up by one. And uh, like Kokomi, Dr. Lalit uh, mentioned about Kokomi, you know, as of now, Kokomi appears to be emerging as some kind of a um, agreed some kind of agreement that yeah they let them represent partially but there are also people op trying to oppose them so uh, we are in the divide it's not that uh, cookies are not uh, divided they are also divided i know it but some kind of a uh, system where we can talk in a reasonable informed and in a logical manner looking into the future that kind of a visionary setup uh, is yet to emerge, you know, with a pan. It is impossible for everyone to agree to every point. No, that is impossible. But at least those agreed points, you know, uh, we can start with that. So that the role of CSOs, I'll put it at the forefront, because politicians cannot take a call in these ethnic crises. It is the CSOs who have to take the role. So, um, and I think they're taking a role. Only thing I feel is that I wish they had little more focused areas. What is possible? What is not possible? Under the sense, that kind of a wisdom, that kind of understanding, if they have it, then possibly things will move forward. The, the third point you uh, mentioned is about the uh, peace initiatives what kind of a peace and i would suggest i would suggest uh, short term is always generally the use of 
you know, uh, carrot and stick, you know, short term. But in the end, it is about uh, people accepting the change. Like, no change can be brought about uh, uh, without people accepting it. Like, uh, in the management jargon, I mean, whatever people you try to change, if the acceptability is zero, everything is down to zero. So, uh, so therefore, I think what could start uh, with some kind of a um, uh, acceptability would be multi-religious, the church, then maybe, you know, call out for, you know, try and get the uh, Valley Insurgents, PLA, UNLF. We know we are divided, but yet there will be certain common grounds. I was trying to, uh, but there are forces which are trying to divide also, like uh, in the West, particularly, uh, I found in some, uh, I was reading all this yesterday that, you know, the Christians are being persecuted, nothing, nothing to do with religion there, what is happening there, you know. So these, there are also many forces, and including external forces. Why won't China be interested in meddling in some way? Why won't uh, people, uh, other countries who are inimical, why won't they take advantage of this? So there are many players also. But in this, the common, uh, uh, what is that, uh, lowest common multiple, LC LCM has to be, uh, you know, worked out. And I think we have, we can, um, uh, uh, we should be able to do it. But it'll take long, long time. It's, uh, it's not tomorrow. It's not going to happen day after tomorrow. It's a long term. But the short term, as I said, is uh, mostly will be carrot and stick. I hope it, uh, uh, it answered uh, at least some part of your questions. Thank you very much, General. That was very insightful. I hand it over to Etipuya. Thank you. Thank you, General Himalaya, for coming to the first NAMA Forum. This is our inaugural forum. Thank you for being here. We greatly appreciate your time and the insights you've provided to us today. Uh, thank you to the panelists, Dr. Shuzalal, Dr. Lalit, Dr. Thuehen, and all the NAMA members who submitted their questions uh, for this discussion hour. I now hand it over to Lin Thuehengom, who is the current treasurer of NAMA, to make the closing remarks. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Hello. Thank you, sir, for being here. Uh, as many have said before, it's an absolute pleasure to have you uh, to have you with us here. And uh, at this point, I want to ask you if you want to add any any point that we have missed in our questions or anything you want, you would like to address. At okay. That I, yeah. Okay. Um, I didn't realize the importance of governance uh, when I was young. Uh, now, in, hind in hindsight, I would say that, as I said earlier, governance is a very wide, wide issue. But finally, it comes down to one basic factor is, does the people, individual, get benefit from the government who are entitled, entitled, you know, does it reach them? And I'm a little skeptical to say that developmental activities, governance uh, worked in our state. It didn't. I wish it was otherwise. So I would say that, I mean, through an extremely informed forum like yours, that all these issues, most of them, I won't say can, everything can be solved, but most of them can be managed well if the governance issues are kept intact or at least seen to be working in some measure. That is the only thing that I would uh, like to say to avoid such kind of a conflicts, to avoid such kind of a violence. That is the only message that I can give at this stage. Lentoy, thank you very much for your uh, giving me a ch another chance to say one more sentence. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so 
I, I think we have a lot of lessons to learn and we have a lot of takeaway from the current situation and uh, even this discussion. But uh, I have to end by saying that we have we are hopeful that Manipur will heal from uh, from this uh, conflict that we are going through and and we will move beyond our fears and find common grounds in our multiculturalism uh, and um, and remember that we have more in common than what what divides us. And uh, we also believe that Manipur, all the CSOs, everyone, one, one positive thing I would say that came out of all this is people are so aware of, uh, so involved in, in the policies that's going on. And everyone I feel is trying to bring back our state to normalcy the best way they know how to. And it might be positive, it might be negative, but it's. I think it's. we are all trying to get back to, you know, as you said, like a sense of equality and sense of, you know, sa safety in our state. So in, uh, in NAMA, we believe that how we do that is by having like open discourses and, you know, by having an, um, and having conversation with everyone and to further discuss, we this is why we have uh, we have set up the Nama Forum, so and uh, this is our first forum. Uh, so, and we look forward to having many more discussion like this. Uh, and um, so, thank you so much for being our first guest today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm honored by this invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.